As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are a key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. I'm so glad you're here with me for the 149th Lent Talk. It's always a privilege and an honor to share this time with you. And, and I, I am just so honored that you're investing this time in, in learning better how to do semiotics and a semiotics reading of the passages of the scripture and the story. I, the, the lectionary passages for this week are, are some great ones. But the two that I really want to focus on, because they both feed each other and, 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 and kind of syncopate with each other and, and vibe with each other, is Micah 6, 1 to 8, and the Matthew account of this, the, um, the Sermon on the Mount, or what we call the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 1 to 12, and Micah 6, 1 to to eight. Now the, the Micah 6, 1 to 8, uh, in fact, a case could be made. When I was growing up, everybody knew John 3, 16. Today, if you're coming up uh, in the church and, and even in, outside the church and parachurch organizations, you know Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. That's kind of the, the locus classicus for the culture today, the Christian culture today. And um, I, I want to I, I wanna say a few words about that and why it is so important and why it is such a revealing part of, of Scripture. At the same time, I want to show how the Beatitudes... The, the eight blesseds um, are, are part of that whole framing, the reframing that Jesus did in many ways in light of, of Micah, of Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of us, you, me? Number one, to walk humbly. Number two, to do justice. Number three, to love mercy. In many ways, this is the distillation of the, the Torah, the 613 commandments. Uh, now, let's not get into discussion of how many actually are there. It's 613 is a metaphor. Uh, in fact, some say there's 614 commandments. So the 614 is thou shalt not forget. <laughs> Whether it's the other 613 commandments or something else somebody does not want you to forget, like the Holocaust, thou shalt not forget. And so in some ways, this is uh, getting the, the, as the Ten Commandments got the 613 to 10, this gets the, the 10 into 3 here. Um, walk humbly. Do justice. Love mercy. And Jesus calling himself the way and the truth and the life is, is a way of reformulating this in, in another way, reframing it. Um, the way... Walk humbly, the way of humility. The life of faith is the way of humility, the truth of justice, and the life of mercy. You love mercy. Um, it, it, way truth in life in English is clunky. That's why I love the Italian so much, um, a, a Latin derivative. Um, the way in Latin is the via, the, the truth in Latin is la verita, and the the life in Latin is, you all know this one, la vita. Okay. So when Jesus calls himself, I am the way, la via, I am the truth, la verita. I am the life, la vita. I mean, it's just so poetic and musical and resonant in Italian and English is clunky, way true. Like, and that's why we need all the languages of the world. 
uh, to help us understand the beauty of what Jesus means when he says, it's not beautiful in English, but how beautiful it is in Italian. La via, la verita, la vita. Follow me, la via, la verita, la vita. And I give you la vita. I am la verita. And the way, the earliest name for Christians, not even Christian, little Christ, was people of the way, followers, not leaders, followers of the way, the truth, and the life. And so we have this, this incredible formulation that is so important. Now, I want to, I, I just want to pause here for a minute because um, everybody, one of the reasons why this is, this is so um, resonant and become kind of the replacement for John 3.16 is Micah 6.8. Is that word justice? That word justice. And the word social justice has almost become kind of a, um, a verbal accessory to everyday speech. You know, it just we just throw it in there like, like salt and pepper, social justice. Um, and um, it, it is true. I mean, there is the social justice, gospel is a social gospel. Now, it's also a personal gospel, but you, but it's not a private gospel, all right? It's, it's personal, but you can't, that's why it's personal and social together. It's a personal gospel and a social gospel. I forget who's one of the said that the, the gospel starts in a domestic affair and ends in a foreign policy, but it begins with, it gets personal and it gets social really quick. Um, John Wesley talked about social holiness. That's just one of his favorite phrases. It's not just personal holiness, it's social holiness. And that's why he was such an opponent of slavery and the equality of women. I could go on and on. Uh, care for the, the, the people in, in, in prisons and in, in, in the poor districts. So the gospel, it, it is a social gospel. There is a, there are, this is, this this key thing here, I, the truth is, is justice, justice or righteousness. But let's hear this. Um, it, it's going to be hard for some of you here. You don't, you know, what, what are you dedicating your life to? I'm dedicating my life to justice. Okay, why do you why are you doing that? Because I love justice. I just love. I'm a lover of justice. Wait a minute. Okay, you know, the, the Micah 6 8, she says you love mercy. It doesn't say you love justice. It says you do justice. The truth is, you live a life that when you see injustice, you, you address it and redress it. You do justice in the face of injustice. By the way, nobody in history, no philosopher in history has ever been ever, ever able to define what justice is. They can tell you what injustice is. Okay. But at Judgment Day, let me tell you, when I stand before my Maker, I'm not going to say, I am a lover of justice, and I'm here because I've dedicated myself to loving justice, and, and, and now it's my turn. Give me justice. Uh, really? I don't know about you, but I'm doing Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. You love mercy, you don't love justice. Okay, don't you, you, what a hypocrite. You want, you want to, no, you do justice, but you love mercy. It, it's an untranslatable word, hesed. It means forgiveness. It means mercy. It, it has all these complex, it, it's a positive thing that also relates to justice too. And justice and, and hesed are, are, are very connected, but it's an active, it's an agency word as is justice, and as is humility. Um, and so this Micah 6, 8, it is so important to live the truth of justice. But justice is, has juridical components, but it really is all about right relationships, a, a right relationship with God, who's a just God, um, a right relationship with ourselves, to, to be in a just relationship 
with ourselves, a right relationship with each other, to have justice, really just, just right relationships with each other. And then finally, a right relation with creation. And this is the one that we, we forget about. This is the, this is the four original sins, the four brokennesses that we read about in Genesis, our birth story, um, the, the four hidings. Where are you? You know, we're hiding, hiding from God. Why are you hiding from God? We're naked and afraid, hiding from ourselves. Um, why, why are you, why did you eat of that tree? She made me do a, a broken relationship with each other and then finally out of the garden. So what we have here um, an understanding of the whole way of life for a good Jew is, and Jesus just reframed it. Jesus was a good Jew. Um, he reframed Judaism in its best uh, framing. The way of humility, the truth of justice, and the life of mercy. And forgiveness. Forgive others as uh, uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our our debtors. Now, this beatitudes that we have here um, is the Jesus equivalent of the Ten Commandments in many ways. He's reframing all of the. The 613 uh, commandments. And Ten Commandments got a ten. Remember, the Ten Commandments came from a mount, Mount Sinai. And that's why this is the Sermon on the Mount for Matthew. It, it because this is Jesus' Mount Sinai. This is Jesus' um, not Ten Commandments, but eight Beatitudes. The significance of significance of eight. Seven is completion. But when you add one to it, you're, it's, you're starting something new. It's completion. It's come to completion. And it's then that completion is yielding a whole something new. And that's what Jesus is doing with these eight Beatitudes. He's, he's, he's completing. He's fulfilling the law. But then he's starting something new here in these, in these eights. Um, Notice the Ten Commandments, what these what Ten Commandments were to Judaism, these eight the blesseds are to, to Christians, but they're not framed in thou shalt and thou shalt not. These are framed in, in blessed Makarios. It has a lot of Makarios. It, we like to translate it blessed. Some people translate it happy are those, and I, I just I, I think the happy word is just not a very happy one. <laughs> it's so complicated. It's so complex. It's so convoluted. It's been so um, kind of ruined by everybody's fingering it. It's so greasy and slimy. So it, it, other translations, equally good, Makarios, is fortunate. Fortunate are those, even rich are those. So Jesus is, is reframing what it means to live, to have a fortune, what it means to live a rich life. And he's not doing in monetary terms, he's doing in relational terms. Um, and so we have richness, fortune, blessedness, abundance, in a non-monetary uh, but relational, relational terms. Now notice too, how when Jesus presents this, um, unlike uh, that, let me just put it like, they're in the form of poetry. Um, rich are those who, rich are those who, rich are those who, it's parallelism. Uh, rich are those who, um, and it's just very, very uh, poetic. I, I love, I love the poetry. So for Matthew, Jesus is the new Moses, and as the the um, as the Torah came from Moses on the Mount, the the Torah 
uh, comes from Jesus on another mount, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. To live a blessed life, a rich life, a favored life, a fortunate life, a blessed life. It's not about property. It's not about principles. It's about relationships. And this is the revolutionary nature of what Jesus is, is doing here. This is why, and I'm going to say some things that are going to kind of irk some of you here, but this is why I never joined the Red Letter Society. Now, I have friends who, who actually, some of my friends started it, and I argued with them. I said, you can't do this. This is where they created, you know, the Red Letter, we'd be a member of the Red Letter Society. We're going to live according to the red letters of the Bible, the sayings of Jesus. And of course, the key to these sayings are these eight beatitudes, eight blessings. And that's really the key of the what it means to live the, this life of justice and this way of humility and this, 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 this truth here, the way truth of life. And I wouldn't do it. I said, you can't, I can't, I can't believe you're doing this. And it, it, it'd be all I could think of when I heard about this. And uh, some, some great people joined it, and that's, that's fine. I don't think Paul would have joined the Red Letter Society. I'll come to that in just a minute. But um, I can think of it was Thomas Jefferson, who was never really, he didn't know what to do about Jesus, you know, the person of Jesus. But he loved the teachings of Jesus. He didn't, he didn't think the miracles were all that important. He said, you know, man of the Enlightenment. And, and so Thomas Jefferson, in his study at Monticello, he got out the scissors, literally got out scissors, and cut everything, all the miracles out of the Bible, and just cut out everything that wasn't coming out of Jesus' mouth. And so everything that Jesus said was preserved, but everything that was, Jesus did, basically, was cut out. And so he had a red letter. He was the first red letter Bible guy. Um, but in cutting out, think what he cut out. Um, and and this is, the, this is the problem here with saying, well, the key of all what it means to be a follower of Jesus is to, is to understand the, the centrality of these Beatitudes and to and to live them. Well, yes and no. Um, basically, all these Beatitudes you can find in the Old Testament. There's not one of the eight that you can't find. It's just Jesus reframing passages from the Old Testament and putting it in a whole new light, putting it in, a, in this poetic kind of form and format. And featuring the relational components, not the um, not the principled ones or the commandment ones. So there's nothing new about these beatitudes. The, the, in fact, Paul, who's the first interpreter of Jesus that we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not the earliest. We we put them first, but they are not the earliest introductions to Jesus. The earliest introductions to Jesus' life and why he was so important comes from Paul. In fact, the, the Bible chrono, chronological order, I've said this before with you, some of you may remember me saying this, the first book of the New Testament in chronological order is First Thessalonians. That'd be a strange Bible. You'd start the New Testament reading this letter, Paul, to the church at Thessalonica, but that's it. And Paul's letters are the earliest introductions we have to who Jesus is and why he's so significant and why he's the axis of history. And Paul only quotes Jesus' teachings five times. And, and only, he, he refers to Jesus' teachings five times, only quotes him once or arguably twice, maybe. Now, these are important quotes that we get. This is my body, uh, broken for you. This is my... But Paul... Interest Paul 
what just totally revolutionized his life was not the teachings of Jesus. It, it, Jesus's revolutionary impact on the world was not, his teachings are just reformatted Judaism. He is embodied Torah. He's embedded temple and embodied Torah. And that's the whole point here. It's not his teachings. See, we want the teachings and we don't want the teacher. We want the principles and we don't want the person. No, Paul is all about the person of Jesus Christ and what he can't stop talking about and what is over and over again in his letters and what he's dedicated his life to and what he spreads the message of. It's not, this is what Jesus taught, this is what Jesus taught. No, it's what he did. He died on a cross. He rose from the dead. He's ascended into heaven. And the Holy Spirit came to bring him to us in a whole new way. And the final thing, you know what? He's coming back. We have a risen, rising, and returning Lord. You won't find any of that in the red letters. None of it. Yes, Jesus' teachings are important. Yes, we ought to learn them. Yes. But it's all about what he did. And he died on a cross. He's our crucified, risen, rising, regnant, and returning Lord. And that's the revolutionary nature of this, of this gospel that we have. And that's why I would not be a red-letter Christian. Because, yes, the red letters are important. But the most important letters, the most important, are not just the red letters. They're the stories that tell us what Jesus did to heal us, to restore us, to redeem us, to reconcile us. As the last Adam, he died on a cross. It's basically the Apostles' Creed. I'm trying to teach my seven-year-old the Apostles' Creed, and he's almost got it learned. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and is Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he descended into hell, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life everlasting. Not one red letter in that creed. Some people have criticized the Apostles' Creed because it has none of the teachings in it. But that's the point. Jesus, God didn't send us more principles. God sent us a person. God didn't send us a statement with all these teachings. Yes, we, we get them, but he, God sent us a Savior. God didn't send us more rules and regulations and requirements. God sent us a Redeemer, who is Christ the Lord. Live this week the way, the truth, and the life. The way of humility, the life of justice, and, I mean, the truth of justice, and the life of mercy, mercy, mercy. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Micah, what does the Lord require of us? Do justice. Love mercy. Walk humbly.
have a humble walk with Jesus this week. Do justice. Love mercy. Forgive.